Ah, oh, how can I make my mixes sound more analog? You need analog man. I feel so much more analog already. So I'm ancient enough to have grown up through the analog era. Indeed, when I was a little squirrel, um, all we had at our disposal were stone tablets that we had to chisel lyrics out on. That's basically the only recording technology we had. And then wax cylinders came along and you know the story, the rest is history. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to have grown up through that analog era. And indeed, I was still using a tape machine until mm, only about five years ago. Now, these days, I mainly use analog tape just for kind of restraining James, really. That's the key thing. Anyway, having that experience has put me in a fortunate position when it comes to digital world in that I can try and transfer some of that knowledge into the way things are done today when the situation requires it. So with some modern productions um, and modern genres of music, it doesn't matter. It's all very kind of digital based and there's lots of auto tune and um, lots of treatment to reverbs and, and, and you know how a modern mix sounds. There's a lot of that doesn't really apply but when we're doing band recordings and here we do a lot of band recordings um, a lot of live recordings then it's great to have that knowledge and apply that to the digital world because a lot of bands these days still want their albums or their recordings to have that classic kind of sound you know the classic rock sound or whatever and I can use the knowledge that I gained back in the day to kind of apply that to digital world so if we look at each individual stage of the process, number one is the recording stage. Now, what can make a huge difference to the kind of cohesiveness of everything and the way that everything glues and gels together is if when you're tracking, when you're doing the recording, use the same inputs for everything. So back in the day, we were recording to tape through large format mixing consoles. You'd go into the live room, mic the band up, do the sound check, get everything sounding as good as you possibly could. And then all the microphones would be going through the desk in the studio straight to tape. So that meant we were using the same input source on everything, the same mic preamps, the same signal chain, everything. When it came to overdubbing vocals, you might patch in a compressor into one of the insert points or maybe use a bit of desk on the EQ, um, a bit of EQ on the desk even. But the but different kind of mic preamps and different chains for different things weren't really a concern. What we did was we just mic the band up and then all the inputs would be plugged into the desk and then instantly you'd kind of start to get a cohesive sound because everything was going through the same electronics. So transferring that knowledge to today's world, if you've got an audio interface and you've got eight mic preamps on it and you've got you know a band that you want to record then use all the same input source for the entire recording so when you're recording the drums say you want eight channels of drum mics record the drums first with your eight channels bosh 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 plugs your mics in record the drums get the other guys to do a, a guide part or whatever and then go back and overdub the guitars and the bass and the vocals and keys whatever else you need but use the same input device so if you're using a mixer use the preamps in the mixer if you're using an interface use the preamps in the interface if you want to expand your input channel count on the interface say you've got uh, like we've got here a focus right claret interface or something like that and you want to add extra mic inputs then try and get the expander that the manufacturer of your interface make to go with that interface because again that will get you a cohesive kind of sound. Lots of people go, oh, I've got, a, you know, I've got a, um, an Audion interface and I'm gonna add a Focusrite eight channel expander and then I'm gonna add a, one of these and I'm gonna add one of those because that sounds slightly better on drums to my ears and this, this interface sounds slightly better for guitars and stuff like that. And that's great, but whilst those things might sound slightly better on certain sources in isolation, when it comes to getting a cohesive recording, I feel that you're much better off doing it the way we used to do it back in the day, and that's just making sure that you use the same inputs for everything. So if you've got a mixer, run everything into that. However you get your sound into the computer, then try and use those input sources for every single thing that you're recording. 
So let's move on to the mixing stage. So you've got everything recorded. It's all recorded using the same preamps, the same interface, yada, yada, yada. You've got everything recorded. Let's have a look at the mix. What are, what are some tips that you can do when you're mixing the song to try and get, again, everything sounding cohesive and everything sounding like it's all supposed to be part of the same song? James, are you all right over there? No. Oh, the sound of struggling. I, can't, I actually can't get it up. So here's a top tip for you. So we've got a session open in Logic Pro, which has got nothing in it, but this is just to you know, show you as an example. Um, and I've got 16 channels of audio. So say I've got all my drums on, I don't know, the first 10 channels, and then I've got two channels of guitars, and I've got two channels of keys, and I've got bass, and I've got vocals. Just imagine a kind of virtual sort of channel scenario there. My top tip for you is, again, to go and think back as to how we would have done this in an analog recording studio. Um, and what we'd have had is we'd have had a large mixing desk and we'd have had a limited amount of outboard equipment. So think of things in terms of an analog mixing desk. So before you go and start piling loads of plugins on different channels, just have a listen to the rough mix, just literally push the faders up, have a listen to your mix, and then think, right, what do I need to do to this? Well, on the drums, I'm gonna need some EQ. On the guitars, they're sounding a bit dull, so I'm gonna need a bit of EQ. The bass could do with a bit more low end, so I'm gonna need a bit more EQ. So before you start reaching for, you know, before you start soloing channels and piling plugins on the bass drum, just listen to what you've got as a whole and then think what do i actually need to do and then if you do need to eq the channels which let's face it on most mixes you do use pick an eq that you like that you're familiar with and you like the sound of and use that on every channel as a basis so my favorite plugins are the slate bundle the slate easy everything bundle it's cheap it's like 15 quid a month and the plugins they're just fantastic they sound absolutely fantastic they sound like the equipment i was using in the 80s and and you know early 90s it, it just sounds that good so <clears throat> the first thing i'm going to do um, is i'm going to select all the channels apart from the output and then i'm going to go for Audio effects, let's go to the Slate. Where are we? Slate Digital Virtual Mix Rack. I'm going to go for the Virtual Mix Rack because that gives me, as near as damn it, effectively kind of a mixer channel. Now, there's lots of different plugins that can do this. Uh, there's a great one from Focusrite, which models their um, studio console. There's, lot, there's plugins from companies like SSL and stuff like that. There's lots of different ways you can do it. And um, the Slate one has Neve, SSL, API type sounding thing, you know, the, the, the top three sort of big boys um, you can replicate, you can replicate, sorry, with the Slate plugins. So let's say I'm on the bass drum here. Um, let's get a couple open. Let me just move that out of the way for a sec. So I don't know why I'm swapping those around because because we haven't actually got any audio. I'm just trying to, to sort of demonstrate something without actually playing anything, which is a bit stupid. Um, but, you know, hopefully you'll get the idea. So I'm going to go for, this is quite an aggressive rock record we're making at the moment. So I'm going to go for the Neve style EQ, the FGN on my drums. So I'm going to put that, imagine this is our bass drum channel um, and I'm going to put that on the snare drum and I'm also going to put that on imagine this one is our guitar channel now the bass drum to my ears again even though it doesn't exist and I'm not playing it the bass drum I think needs a boost at around 50 hertz so I'm going to bring that down to about 50 hertz and I'm going to give it a slight boost there the drums as a whole at about 3.5k are sounding a bit wooden they're just sounding there's something about sort of three and a half k on drums i don't really like so i'm going to take a little bit of that out um i'm going to bring in a tiny bit of the top shelf because that is you know it's just brightening things up slightly and giving the drums a bit of air so that's a really basic kind of eq setting now if i go to the guitar channel three and a half k at the moment is sounding great on the guitar so i want to give that 
a little bit of a boost. So let's give that a little bit of a boost. Uh, there's quite a bit of rumble and stuff happening down at around 50 hertz. So I'm just going to roll that off up to 80. That'll take everything out of the very low end of the guitars and just remove all that uh, low frequency information that's muddying things up and enabling the guitars to not cut through the mix quite as well. And it's also obscuring some frequencies from the kick and stuff like that. Um, so just as a very basic example, and the, the guitar's quite tinny up the top, so I'm just going to take a bit of the top end off. Now, if you compare those two EQs, you can see that what I've done there is I've kind of, imagine this is our drums and that's our guitar. I've, the way I've used the EQ is I've added some frequencies in the guitar that I've taken out of the drums. I've taken some frequencies out of the guitar that I've added on the bass drum. And so everything's starting to go sort of like that. It's all starting to gel together quite well. But what's really critical is that I've used the same EQ. So I've picked the EQ that I like the sound of. And because these sort of classic model EQs have their own personality, they have their own sound. What that means is that that personality, the personality of that EQ is applied across the whole mix. And it's much easier to get a cohesive sound by using the same EQ than it would be if I'd used, say, a Neve on one channel and an SSL on another and an API and Logic's own EQ on another one. And, you know, once you start to get lots of different things happening on lots of different channels, then it can be really difficult to try and get your mix to gel together in the right way. So by using the same EQ across every channel, even just as a starting point, there may be channels where you need to do something different in order to get it to work, and you know, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, but if you use the same EQ across every channel, then you're gonna start to enhance that cohesive sound that you started to get at the recording stage. Okay, so I've actually got a mix up now rather than trying to um, explain something to you on an empty logic project, which is a bit stupid. Uh, someone said once that trying to explain about audio is like dancing about architecture or something like that, and that's kind of true. Um, so I've got an actual mix up so we can hear some stuff going on. Now you can see on this mix that I've taken my own advice and we've got plugin wise, we've got virtual mix rack right the way across every channel. So I'm using the same plugin on every channel. Um, most of them aren't doing a lot because um, the, the you know we got the sound fairly right at source. So let me just take a track that I know has got nothing on it at all. Let's take the bongo track there. So this has just got plugin wise. Um, we've got the virtual channel plugin on there and not a lot else. I think I've got an expander on it as well somewhere, but. Um, basically we've, we've got, we've got nothing on there. So another trick you can use to try and get a more analog sound is again, go back to thinking how we used to do it back in the day. So you wouldn't, um, so using the same plugin, using the same kind of EQ on every channel, you're going to get a more cohesive sound. And that was how we mixed records. Um, but what, used to quite often happen with a lot of classic rock records is you'd do the tracking the recording in one studio and then the album would be mixed in a different studio and quite often um albums would be tracked or recorded on a neve or a trident or something like that something with a little bit of mojo and then the album would go off to a mix engineer who would inevitably be using an ssl or or something like that um, SSLs became, you know, widely used as the board to mix records on, and for very good reason. They sounded fantastic. So looking at those two stages, now obviously you can't do your tracking stage if you haven't got a Neve. Um, you, you can't, you know, you can't do that. And who can afford a Neve desk to track on these days? Um, a few of us, certainly not me, unfortunately. But we can emulate that again in analog world. So going back to the EQ thing, if we take the bass drum as an example, say all we need to do on the bass drum is just add a tiny bit of 60 hertz. What we could do is we could load a Neve EQ. We can get our frequency down to around 60 hertz there. And say we need to add, we think it sounds best if we add 4 dB of 60 hertz so 4 db at 60 hertz don't do that break it up into two stages so when we were recording um, again back in the day we might have thought that the 
bass drum needed a bit of 60 hertz and tried it and oh yeah it does so we might have applied that eq on the way in to make things easier during the mixing stage it was a lot of the analog era was all about getting sounds right at source so using the best sounding microphones for particular sources and using things that fitted together well um, and there's many classic records that i think van halen's well, some of van halen's hits were, were recorded using almost entirely sm57s and you look at the track list and it was sm57 on the bass drum sm57 on the snare sm57 on the toms they might have used sm58s as overheads it was and it, and it all kind of gave it a more a more cohesive sound which again goes to show that it doesn't really matter you know you can use budget equipment and get and get professional results um so anyway going back to my point so instead of boosting that at 4 db boost it at 2 db ish and then so this is our recording stage so we've got a little bit of virtual channel mojo going on we've got a little bit of eq that we might have applied on the way in if we were tracking in a studio with a neve desk but then when it comes to the mix then add the ssl eq so now we're kind of replicating the recording stage with the neve and the mixing stage with the ssl so that other 2 db that we think we need at 60 hertz we can bring the ssl eq down to 60 hertz and we can just give it another 2 db and then what happens is we've got our 4 db of boost at 60 spread across two eqs one is kind of emulating the recording stage and one is emulating the mixing stage so that's a real top tip for mixing is is and and you know if you're going to do that do that on every channel so do it a little bit on the guitars as well do half with one eq and half with another but keep it the same across every channel because what we never used to do in the analog day would we'd, we'd never mix the drums on a trident mix the guitars on an ssl mix the keys on a api and mix the vocals on a I don't know whatever else but you know everything was mixed on one desk so that was a huge part of keeping that kind of cohesive sound and, and gluing everything together um, so that's a top tip for the mix stage now when it comes to um, the mix bus the two bus the master bus the output bus whatever you want to call it our two our once the mix is done and we've got our our, our two track stereo bus at the end Here's where you can have a little bit of fun and you can start doing things like emulating tape machines. So again, I'm going to use the Slate ones as an example because they're really good plugins. Uh, let's just get the... Da -da 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 -da. Whoops, let's get the plugins up there. So let me just get rid of the, the channel one. So here we've got two plugins going on. Uh, we've got a virtual tape emulation. Let me just show you the lovely fancy uh, virtual tape there. That looks, if we spin it up, that looks a bit like James at the moment, trying to unspool himself from a reel of quarter inch tape. You are sounding very analog though. I'm very I'm, analog. You're very analog, very, very analog. I hate tape. Yeah, tape's a nightmare. There's the, there's a, that, that was me 20 years ago, trying to, after having tried to do an edit. You, you know, where's the edit? Oh, it's in the bin um okay let's so let's have a listen to what to what this is doing so we've got a bit of track playing let me just get up there so i can find a bit of the song well this is a bit of the song isn't it this is fine uh right let me just turn both these off and then i'll explain what each one's doing so let's let's actually go to tapes the final stage so let's just so mixing onto we'd mix onto generally half inch two track tape and then that would be it that would go off to the mastering engineer he'd master the record and then it would go off to um to manufacturing so let's have a look at the bus compression first so this is our bus compressor uh, rack if you like here uh, we're modeling an ssl classic bus compressor uh, a focus right red and a manly very mu compressor here now i love the sound of these compressors they're sort of character compressors they just add something nice to the sound even if they're not compressing and in this case they're not compressing they're just as you can see from the meters they're literally doing nothing at all they're just adding that kind of transformer saturated lovely sort of sound that you get let's give you an example of that so let's get let's just get him out of the way for a minute because he's off so this is off let's go to a bit of the track where we got some vocals and let's turn this on and just listen to the difference
So it's just doing something nice to the sound. It's not actually compressing it. I'm going to leave any compression uh, to the to the mastering engineer. If 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 you know if if the track needs a little bit more compression, I'm going to allow basically allow the mastering engineer room to work. So I'm not going to compress it too much. So if he feels it needs a bit of compression, he can put a bit of compression on it. Um, and you know I'm going to leave that to to him. Um, now that's you know that's one approach you can take if you, if you're um, if you're mixing. I get it. So I do these days. I do more mastering than I do mixing, um, which is is great. That's that's the part of the process now that I enjoy most. I just really love mastering music, and in some cases do very very little to people's um, tracks because the mix engineers, a lot of the mix engineers I work with, and a lot of the people that send me mixes to master are so good that. I just play the tracks back and listen to it, and I'm like, "Well, that sounds amazing." I, you know, it doesn't. I don't. I definitely don't need to compress that. And then my job is to not put my stamp on it, but my job is to not break their mixes. Let them know. You know, have a conversation if I think there's a little bit. There's, there's something weird going on at a particular frequency or something like that. Have a conversation with them about that, and if they go, "Oh, yeah, thanks," I, I've never picked, I hadn't picked up on that. Then you know, either they can fix it in the mix, or I can fix it to a certain degree in the in the mastering process. Um, but it's my job not to break their mixes. So a lot of people, a lot of people starting out who haven't been doing it very long, say, "I've got quite a bit of stuff on my on my master bus. Should I take it off?" Um, and I say, well, no, if you've, if you've mixed into that and if you like the sound of what the compressor's doing and you like the sound of the EQ you've put on it, then leave it on and send it to me. If it's awful, if you've really overcranked the bass end or something like that, then you know I'll say, I think the, we need to work a little bit on the bass end and maybe get you to send the mix with less processing on. We, you know, again, it's a two-way conversation thing. Um, but to a lot of people, I just say, just leave it on. If it sounds great, you know, we're always saying, um, it's the Andrew Sheps quote, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what comes out of the speakers. And that's, that's absolutely true. It doesn't really matter how you get there. Um, so in this case, the bus compressors on the master bus are doing nothing at all. They're just adding a little bit of mojo to the sound. So then the final stage uh, back in analog land was you know, bouncing everything down to your, to your uh, two track tape machine and that's what this is modeling and the slate plugin does a fantastic job of this well I'm, i love the slate stuff we're not sponsored by slate in any shape or form um but i just love their stuff it, they've done a really great job uh fabrice gabriel who's the guy who does the sort of coding and modeling and stuff like that he's just such an incredible engineer he really is he's done a great job with everything they've released it's just fantastic um, and it's it's really good value as well. They're adding to the collection all the time, and it just all sounds great. Whenever they release a new plugin, we download it, and it's like <gasps> that's changed my life. It's you know it's, they do some really really good stuff. Um, if I could only have one set of plugins, um, I'd go for the slate stuff every time because it's great for guys like me. It's got knobs on, so I know straight away what stuff's doing because you know I've worked with the hardware back in the day. So let's have a little listen to Mr. Tape to see what he's doing to the mix. Um, so let's turn it on and you'll hopefully hear a little bit of a difference, especially in the low end. So listen on headphones or on speakers. Now I think that's a little bit too much. So I'm just gonna back it off, back off the input, so as the level to tape is just a little bit less than it was. That sounds better to me. It was just verging on distortion where it was, so I've just backed that off a tiny bit. Um, and remember back in the day, we weren't, that. you know, the common misconception is that we were cranking everything. We weren't cranking everything. We were very conservative with levels. The main concern um, back in analog land was signal to noise ratio. Everything made noise. The tape hissed, the machines hummed, the desks made noise. Uh, you'd get each channel of the mixing desk would, would 
create a little bit of self noise what plugged into it would create noise and that was cumulative it could add up to an enorm enormous amount of noise by the end of a session so our main concern was signal to noise ratio so we were pushing things just slightly into the red just to get the maximum level to tape and the maximum level going through the electronics without them distorting um, okay in some specific cases like you know some funk records and stuff like that you distorted a few choice things because you wanted that crunchy sound but generally as a rule we were just just pushing things into the red so try and sort of respect that in digital world and keep your virtual compressing and your virtual um, saturating try and you know rein that in a little bit um, get it to uh, again another uh, one of the golden rules with a with a, uh, a neve preamp is to get it to just at the point where it's just starting to to clip and then back it off a notch and that's the approach i take in daw world with the analog plugins so um, that's what i've done with the tape machine here it's just nudging into distortion and so i've just backed it off a bit because distortion can be it can very quickly add up and it, you can sort of overblow things and they just all sound they all start sound start they all start sounding really mushy um, so try not to overcook things don't push things into the red too much and if you're sending your mixes off to be mastered by a by a separate mastering engineer and you should be um, then allow them a little bit of room to work so don't just smash everything um, and go you know there you go because they'll listen to that and go whoa that's okay um, so you know leave a little bit of headroom for the for the mastering engineer to work so that's it i think james is still struggling to get out of his i'm gonna be here all day He's going to be here all day, so I'll get the scissors out in a minute and we'll free him. So just a quick recap, get your signals as cohesive as you can at source level at the recording stage. Use the same mic preamps, the same interface, the same desk, the same whatever you've got. Keep all that the same um, and try and get everything sounding as cohesive as it possibly can at the recording stage. Stage number two, the mixing stage, use the same plugins across the board. So if you've got a favorite EQ, use that EQ on everything because what starts to happen is that if you notch three and a half k out of one frequency and, and on one channel and boost um three and a half k on another channel it'll fit much better than if you use different types of eq on different sources that'll just help to kind of bring everything together um, emulate eq that might have been used on the recording stage and then might be used on the mixing stage so for classic rock put a neve eq on doing half the work and then an SSL EQ on doing the other half of the work rather than having one EQ doing all the work. Again, the same with compressors in uh, you know SSL G series and stuff like that. We used to have uh, each each channel would have its own compressor, um, and that again helped to give a cohesive sound. So if you've got a compressor you like the sound of, use that compressor across. Just try using the same compressor across every channel. Uh, maybe treat the vocal slightly differently because we'd quite often do that back in the analog world we'd put the vocals through a few other things to kind of bring the magic out um, but certainly for instruments drums bass guitar keys horns whatever just you know try and keep the eq the same type keep the compression the same type and that will help you get a cohesive kind of balance and a, just a cohesive gluey sound and then um, your output bus treatment don't go mad that's the that's the number one thing um, if you want that classic tape sound try a little bit of tape emulation on it get the tape emulation to where it's just starting to add the magic you want and then back it off slightly just back it off a notch like i've done here and again with your bus compression don't be afraid to put bus compression on if you find a compressor you like the sound of i love the sound of the slate um uh, VBC rack and I use it on a lot of, of band type recordings and mixes that we do here I use it occasionally for mastering as well if someone sent me a track that's completely uncompressed and does need some compression on it I prefer having three compressors doing a third of the work rather than one compressor doing everything um, and you know that can sound great so keep your keep it subtle you know don't go mad um, keep it subtle play around have fun um, and we'll see you in the next video. Please subscribe. There's thingies on the screen now. There'll be a couple of videos probably here and here somewhere, and there'll be a subscribe thingy in the middle. So please subscribe and help us out. I'm going to go and cut James out, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.